Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to another Wednesday Bible study at the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia. Running a little late this evening, had some things that got in the way, and and uh, but we nevertheless we're here, and God is good. And we pray and hope that you've had a great uh, day and having a great uh, evening. And we thank God for His grace, and we thank God for His mercy. Well, it's Wednesday, and it is um, October 14th, 2020, and here we are one more time. Uh, tonight, we're going to be studying about exercising dominion over anxiety and fear. Exercising dominion over anxiety and fear. And as we get started tonight, we want to be remembering uh, those families that stand in the need of prayer. Uh, certainly, the coronavirus has been still running rampant in our country. And so we are praying uh, for all of those families that have been directly affected, those people who've been infected uh, with the virus. And even those who have died, I believe the number is close to 214,000 now, if not over. And uh, we're just praying for all those families. We're praying for all those families. We're praying for our national leaders that God will uh, give them wisdom as to what to do in this hour. We're praying for our churches. Uh, many churches are, are still uh, meeting and they're convening. And so pray that they'll be careful and that they will not uh, contribute to the spread of this virus. Listen, uh, we're in the middle of early voting, just getting started with early, early voting, rather, and want to encourage you to exercise your civic duty and to go out and vote, whether you're going to vote in person or do a mail-in ballot or whatever you're going to do, make sure you exercise your option and your uh, right to vote. People, who, people have died, and shed blood, sacrificed. Uh, for the privilege of voting, and we should not take that lightly. Well, as always, we want to remind you that uh, on tomorrow night is our uh, prayer line, and we want to encourage you and uh, to call in and uh, share in the prayer line on tomorrow night. That's Thursday night, as every Thursday night. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the number you can call is 717-275-8940. That is 717-275-8940. Uh, and as I've said earlier now, you do not have to be 
a member of New Hope Baptist Church. Uh, you don't even have to be in the state of Georgia. You don't even have to be in the United States. No matter where you are, when you see this video, uh, if you feel the need to call in for prayer, we encourage you to do so. You know, people often say that they do everything and then they result to prayer as a, re as a last resort. I've heard people say, well, you know, there's nothing else I can do now but pray. But listen, prayer should not be our last resort. Prayer should be our first option. If we would learn to pray, uh, the Bible says in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, turn from the wicked ways, seek my face, pray, he says, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal the land. And certainly if there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying, that time is right now. So I want to encourage you, as tomorrow night, uh, to call the prayer line, 717, <coughs> excuse me, 275. Uh, 8940. That's 717-275-8940. And once you call that number, the access code is 977-3571, uh, followed by the pound sign. And should you have a prayer concern or a prayer request that you would like to uh, leave, you can leave as in the form of a voice message or a text anytime prior to 645 that's on Thursdays. And remember now that that time is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you want to leave a prayer message, a prayer concern, or a prayer request, you can uh, leave a voice message or a text at 762-499-3411. All right. Now, as we pray tonight, we're remembering our, our friend, uh, Brother Charles Clark. He's, re, he's recuperating from surgery. I understand he had knee surgery. We are praying for him. We are praying for the, um, the Gilstrap family. Uh, our good friend, Mother Ola Mae Gilstrap, made her transition the other day. I believe the funeral is a uh, graveside service. I believe it's Friday. And certainly we are praying for her. We're praying for the Hammond family. Sister Mary Hammond also made her transition. We're praying for the Kendall family and the Mount Zion Baptist Church of Buckhead, Georgia. Pastor uh, Bishop uh, Timothy Kendall uh, made his transition. And so we're just praying uh, not only for them, but for other families that have stood and will stand around the graveside in the days to come. We want to remember them in our prayers. Listen, it's their time now. Um, it may be ours tomorrow. And so we need to be praying. Also understand that uh, Sister uh, uh, Ernestine Thomas uh, and uh, family had some relatives to die, a relative to die. So we're lifting them up in our prayers also. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. And, and we're also still remembering uh, the the uh, victims from uh, the Garden of Gethsemane homeless shelter uh, that was struck by a tornado on last uh, Saturday. And so we're lifting uh, Pastor Clara Lett and the homeless shelter residents in prayer. And not only are we praying, but uh, we want to make sure that we do what we can to help alleviate their suffering. Did you know that oftentimes when we pray, and it's okay to pray, and we need to pray, but many times we can be an answer to pray. And so let's, let's allow ourselves to be used by God to be answers to prayer. But in the meantime, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our safe travel to and fro. We thank you for your protection. 
that you kept your arms of protection all around us and you kept us from our hurt, harm, and danger. And you enable us to come once more and again and uh, congregate and meet virtually through this uh, platform of Facebook Live. And we thank you, God, for those who are watching and listening uh, even right now, and even those who are watching watch and listen in the future uh, through replay. We just pray, God, that you just uh, touch whatever uh, they need. God, uh, touch whatever desire they have in their hearts. Uh, God, that you just touch, heal, and deliver even right now. We thank you for your deliverance power. We thank you, God, for being with our brother Charles as we, he went through surgery. And we thank you, God, for, for just all of those that you have just blessed uh, to be able to be restored and are restoring to health. We pray, God, for those people who are right now who are suffering um, from this coronavirus. God, we just pray that you just alleviate their suffering. You just touch their bodies right now and bring health and healing to their bodies. And then God, we pray for those families who've lost loved ones, not just from the virus, but uh, even from other uh, means of death, that we, you would just touch them right now, God, and comfort them as only you can. Look down on the Gilstrap family, God, the Hammonds family, and uh, the Kendall family and the Mount Zion Baptist Church of Buckhead. And, and Lord, we just, we just, we just lifting up our voices and our face to you. And know, oh God, that you're the answer. You are the answer. Now help us, oh God, to be instruments of your answer, that we might be your hands, that we might be your feet, that we might be your mouthpiece that when people look on us, they will not see us, but they'll see you in us. This we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. As we mentioned earlier, tonight, we're going to be talking about exercising dominion over anxiety and fear. Exercising dominion over anxiety and fear. Uh, this is a um, problem that many people are having all over the land and all over the country. People are being consumed with anxiety. It is a major problem. People are being consumed with anxiety and they're being consumed by fear. But I want you to know tonight that it doesn't have to be that way. If you are a child of God, you have resources available to you to help you deal and exercise dominion over anxiety and fear. And so to the lesson tonight, we're gonna to look at some things that will help us. Now, last week, uh, we talked about exercising dominion over anger. And anger is one of the most uh, devastating uh, emotions. And if anger is one of the most devastating emotions, then certainly fear is one of the most crippling emotions. But now remember, God made us with these emotions. You don't want to, you don't want to completely get rid of anger. You really don't want to get completely get rid of anxiety and fear, but you want to be able to dominate and put them in their proper perspective in your life. So that's what, we, that's what this lesson is about tonight, exercising dominion over anxiety and fear. So what is anxiety? Let's start off with some definitions. What is anxiety? Well, anxiety again can be defined as the apprehensive 
uh, unequal, un, uh, uneasiness and nervousness, usually over an impending or anticipated ill. Is the apprehensive une uneasiness or nervousness usually over an impending or anticipated ill. It is an abnormal, no, it's abnormal. Anxiety is not normal. It is abnormal. It is an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs such as tension, sweating, increased pulse rate, by doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat, and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. And then I have the, a Greek word here is diagot, diagot. Uh, this is the Greek word uh, that's translated as anxiety in the Old Testament. It means worry and concern. The Greek word, uh, marinaio, marinaio, it means to have anxious concern based on apprehension about possible danger or misfortune. It is to be worried about or to be anxious about. That is the definition. Those are the definitions of anxiety. Now, not only are we, are we dealing tonight with anxiety, but we're also dealing with fear. And so what is fear? What is fear? And, and what is the difference between fear and anxiety? Well, fear can be defined as an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. And the most common Old Testament Hebrew term is used about 437 times, is a word called yare, yare. And it denotes various degrees of anxious dread or terror generally experienced in the face of danger or the suspicion thereof. Now in the New Testament, and you need to be aware of this, that in the New Testament, there are three words. There are three words in the New Testament that are used to denote fear. And, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this because, you know, as we read our Bibles, as we read our English Bibles, you need to understand that sometimes a word that's used in English, uh, whereas, we have, whereas we have only one word, there may be two Hebrew words, there may be three Greek words, and all of these words have different shades of meaning. Uh, the Greek language and the Hebrew language, in many ways, is more precise than the English language. And so it, 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 uh, it would be a good idea uh, to have a good, uh, strong concordance. It's one of the things I recommend. You don't have to be a theologian, don't have to be a Bible scholar, but I recommend anybody reading the Bible that you at least need to have a good, strong concordance and a good, strong uh, um, Bible dictionary to help you understand the biblical text. So in the New Testament now, there are three different words uh, most commonly used to denote fear. First word is the most common is a word called phobos. Uh, actually, the, the, the Greek noun is phobia phobos and phobia, uh, it refers to the emotion elicited by a sense of alarm, danger, or anticipation of a negative experience. It is from this word, that uh, phobos, that we get the English word phobia. And I was just reading the other day, looking over some notes I took earlier. There are over 500 officially recognized phobias. Can you, can you imagine that? There are over 500 officially recognized phobias. And I was, I was going through the list 
And uh, I heard somebody uh, on the list, there's even a fear preacher, <laughs> a fear church. You know, we, we're common with this, this claustrophobia where we, you know, we, we, you know we, 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 we have anxiety and apprehension when we're in enclosed places. Uh, there's a fear of spiders, there's a fear of uh, height. These are some of the common phobias that we're more concerned, more, um, um, more uh, familiar with. And then in addition to the word phobis, uh, phobos, uh, there's another Greek word, is eulaphobia, phob, eulabiamai, eulabiamai, and I'm probably uh, pronouncing that wrong. And I know that my Greek professor is probably having a stroke right now. He heard me say that. And so let me just leave it alone. Uh, but this is, it means to fear or reverence. This is to regard with feelings of respect and reverence, considered hollowed or exalted to be in awe of. This is the word that the Bible used to denote the proper reverential fear of God. Fear of God. This is the Greek word that's used for that. And while I'm on that subject, while I'm on that page, let me just say this. The fear of God is, is, is similar to the fear or the respect we should have for our parents or for parental authority. Listen, God does not want you uh, to serve him out of dreadful fear. He don't want you to serve him out of being terrorized fear, that kind of fear. He wants you to serve him out of his reverential fear, uh, akin to the fear that a child would have uh, for his parents. And so that's what this Greek word means. Now this last word, delios, a delos. Uh, this refers to timidity. Uh, the lack of courage. This is cowardly fear. The noun and the verb forms of this word is only found four times. Only found four times in the entire Greek New Testament. This is the fear that God condemns and disapproves of. Let's look at these passages right, right quick because this is, these are the passages where, where we find this, uh, this, this, this type of fear is Matthew. First reference is Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. And that passage in Mark, we're not going to read the Mark passage because the Mark passage is actually a parallel to the Matthew passage. It's just a parallel to the, you say it's the same, uh, same incident, uh, but it's Mark's rendition of it. So let's read Matthew chapter eight and verse 26. And I believe this is when uh, there the disciples are out there on the Sea of Galilee. Storm has come up. Jesus is asleep in the hinder part of the ship, and um, they wake him up saying, Master, don't you care that we perish? And this is Jesus' response in uh, verse 26. He says, and I'm reading from the King James, and he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great Calm. Now that word fearful, what he's actually saying is, why are you so cowardly? Why are you, why are you acting like cowards? Now, I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, have not heard much teach, teaching on this, have not read this much on this, but it seems to imply from Jesus' response it seems to imply uh, the, the implications, the, the impressions I get is that Jesus fully expected them to handle this storm without 
waking him up. It seems that he's a bit peeved by being woken, by being awoken. You know, they're in the middle of a raging storm. They're wrestling with the storm, but Jesus is resting. That's a sermon. They were wrestling with the storm while Jesus was resting in the storm. And the lesson he's trying to convey to them is that listen, you have you you have the authority. You could handle this situation without me. And so he says, why are you so cowardly? Why are you cowardly? That's what he's saying. Well, let's look now at, uh, at 2 Timothy. And most of us are familiar with this verse. And you probably heard it quoted uh, where Paul writes to, to Timothy. Apparently, Timothy, uh, a new pastor, was probably intimidated or being intimidated because of his age. And so Paul writes to him to encourage him. And he says to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That word for fear is that same root there. He's talking about cowardly fear. He's talking about cowardly fear. Now, this next passage is the one that, that really, I mean, this, this really surprised me uh, when I read the first time I read this passage. And you have to understand it in context. Uh, this, is, this is in Revelation 21. This is when it's all over, said and done. And, uh, and these are the people that are going to be outside of the kingdom. These are the people who are going to experience the second death. Now listen, anytime you're reading the Bible and you see a list, everything on that list is important. But they don't just the biblical authors didn't just put stuff together as they thought about it and say, well, I'm just writing this down. It's coming to my mind. No, list, usually in the Bible, list means, the list means something. And you need to pay particular attention to the first items on the list and the last items on the list because there's a message in their order. But look at this. Verse 8 says, well, let's read verse 7 to get some context. He says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderer and homemonger and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, the first thing, the first time I read this, I said, wow, you know, I I can, I can, I can see, I can see the idolaters because they made something God that wasn't God. They worship idols. I can see them. I can see liars. The Bible says God hates liars. He hates a lie. The devil is the father of lies. I can see that. Sorcerer. By the way, this word sorcerer, uh, uh, the Greek word is, is, is uh, uh, pharmakeus. So it's, it's, it's not, not just reference to spells, but it's, it's a reference to people who also use drugs to alter their minds and, and, and whatnot, as far as trying to change things. Homongerous, I can see them. Murderers, I definitely can see them there. The abominable, I can see them there. Even the unbelieving, because we have to believe in order to be saved. Can I tell you something? The only thing you can do, or the only thing you have to do to be lost, is simply not believe, to be an unbeliever. 
That's why over and over again, the Bible encourages us to believe the gospel, to believe the good news. And biblical belief now is not just a mental, a mental ascent. Biblical belief is trust, relying, depending on. So I, I can see all of those having their part in the lake of fire. But listen, the thing that blew my mind was this first item on the list. He said the fearful. He said the fearful would have their part in the lake of fire. And this fearful here is talking about the cowardly. The cowardly. Uh, the old folks used to sing a song that said, God can't use no coward soldier. God can't use no coward soldier. He says the cowardly shall have their part in the lake of fire. There's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about the, uh, uh, Moses is giving instruction. And he's saying that if there's anybody, he tells the people as they get ready to go to war, he says that there's anybody who's fearful among you, anybody who's cowardly among you, he said, let them go home. He said, let them go home. They don't need to be out fighting in the war. If you're cowardly, he says, you go home. Why? Because fear is infectious. Fear spreads. And that's what that text says. He says, now let them go home, lest they cause the heart of their brothers to faint also. And so this is, this is amazing to me that the fearful will have their part in the lake of fire. So there, there is a difference. There is a difference. There is a difference between anxiety and fear. There's a difference. They're, they're, they're similar. They overlap. But there's a basic difference between anxiety and fear. And what is, what is that difference? Well, anxiety is the emotional response to potential. And I have potential there marked off because that's the key word. Anxiety is the emotional response to potential occurrence. It doesn't have to be anything happening. It's just something you think might happen can cause anxiety. In other words, anxiety is caused by attention given to the possibility of danger, ill, or trouble. Not the actual occurrence, but the mere possibility. Thinking about that can cause anxiety. That's the cause of anxiety. Whereas fear, on the other hand, fear is the emotional response to actual danger, ill, or trouble. So the difference is anxiety is that you, you, you're worried about what might happen. Fear occurs when it's happening and, that, and you respond to what's actually happening. So anxiety is about an emotional response to potential occurrence, whereas fear is the emotional response to actual occurrence. Okay? So, for example, and I have this example here. Anxiety may occur when, when you're in a dark alley and you encounter uh, someone who looks like they might have a weapon they look suspicious uh, to potentially threaten or harm you. When, you, when, you, when you're when you feeling uneasy about that, that's anxiety. Whereas fear now, fear occurs when you're in a dark alley, same alley, in the person, same person you encounter, actually has a weapon. You see the gun, you see the knife, and, and, and they're threatening you with it. And as a result, you, you, you uh, experience fear. So it's a thin line, uh, but, th but that's the difference between fear and anxiety. Now listen, according to the behavioral scientists, humans are born with only two basic fears. 
scientists, the behavior scientists say this, the psychologists, they say to us that the only two basic fears human beings are born with, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. All other fears are learned. You learn to be afraid of the dark. You learn to be afraid of people. You learn to be afraid of speaking in public. All those are learned fears. The only two fears we were born with, the only two natural fears, is the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. All other fears are learned. Now this is good news because if all these fears are learned behavior, that means they can be unlearned because any learned behavior or response can also be unlearned. Now listen, fear is not always bad. There are some good fears, you know, and in fact, as 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 when we are when we are babies, when we're infants, when we grow up as toddlers, that's when our parents teach us to fear certain things for our protection, for our safety. So fear is not always bad. There are some good fears. Uh, the fear of actual danger actually serves to help keep us safe. The reverential fear of God and of righteous authority teaches us to worship God and to have proper respect for parental and other authorized authority. In fact, that's what's, I, that's what's wrong with, with, with a lot of people in the world. They have lost their fear. They have lost the fear of God. And certainly, you know, Paul talked about in the last days where they would lose the fear of parents respecting their parents. Uh, that, that fear is, is, is dreadfully missing in our world today. Well, President Franklin Roosevelt once famously said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And so I have a few acronyms I ran across and you might know some more, but I ran across these few, these three uh, acronyms for fear uh, in my reading. Uh, fear, someone has said that fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear, false evidence appearing real. Uh, someone has also said that fear is failure expected and received. Failure expected and received. Did, did you know? that um, we, we defend our fear, <laughs> we defend our fears. It's, 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 you know, uh, for instance, you're, you're, you're working at work and you, you hear a, an announcement across the loudspeaker, or maybe you get a phone call, um, you know, come to the office, you need it in the office. Well, what, what goes through your mind? Uh, if you're not careful, all these negative thoughts will go through your mind. Well, what did I do now? What's going on now? I'm about to get fired. What, what's going on? It, whatever it is, most times is negative. And, and you go to the office, and it could be you're being called to the office because you're being promoted. You're getting a raise. And then if, if, if that happens, you say, whoo, wow. You're relieved that what you expected did not happen. Or... On the other hand, you could be right. <laughs> you could have been goofing off and doing the wrong thing, and you've been called to the office, and you know you get there, and your supervisor says, "Well, hey, we're gonna let you go. We're gonna have to let you go." And what do you do? Nine times out of ten, you'll go back to your coworkers and you'll tell them, "I told you I was about to get fired," you know, and that's and and you brag, well, or you defend rather uh, the validity of your expectation. So failure, uh, expected and received. And then someone also has said 
that fear is forgetting everything is all right. And I might amend that to say that fear is forgetting everything is going to be all right. Listen, you are a child of God. There's absolutely nothing that's going to happen to you that you and God can't handle. And so why should we fear? Why should we be discouraged? Just learn to lean and trust and depend on God. So what is the anxiety, fear, master dominion key? What is the anxiety, fear, master dominion key? Just as the Lord told Cain, that he must master, that is exercise dominion over the sin of danger, of anger. Uh, we talked about that last week in Genesis chapter four, verse seven. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, one, and also in John 14, 27, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, in me rather. And then verse 14 says, uh, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus is saying, you can master, you can exercise dominion over anxiety and fear. You need to understand what I call the law of command. And what the law of command simply says is that whatever the Lord has commanded, it is completely possible for us to comply with what is commanded. And not only is it possible, but the Lord has provided whatever is needed in order for us to obey the command. The Lord does not command anything that is impossible for us to do. Now, here's the kicker. It may be impossible for you to do it by yourself, but it's possible for you to do it with his help. And see, that's the kicker. That's the key. You see, I think a lot of times we, 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 we think so small that we only think that God can help us do what we can do by ourselves. But God wants us to help us do what he called us to do that we can only do with his help. Humanly, it's impossible. But as Jesus said on one occasion, with God, all things are possible. But note in the text, in the King James Version, the New King James and the English Standard Version, we read, let not your heart be troubled. The New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, and the New Revised Standard Version says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, what's the implication? The implication is we can control our state of mind. Let me say that again. We can control our state of mind. Therefore, if we allow our hearts to be troubled, it is not because we cannot help it, but rather it is because we allow it. Now, let me say that again, because that may be a tough pill to swallow. Because normally, we don't want to accept responsibility for our emotional response. So let me say it again. We can control our state of mind. If we allow our hearts to be troubled, 
It is not because we cannot help it, but rather it is because we allow it. And we allow it mostly because of ignorance and the lack of discipline. We allow it because most people don't understand that you can't control your mind. They don't know that. They've never been taught that. And since they've never been taught that, they've never practiced, they, they've never tried to do, they never disciplined. It takes discipline to control your thoughts. It takes discipline to control your mind. It takes discipline to be a child of God. It, this, you, you, can't, you can't be successful in the Christian walk just picking up your Bible every now and then and praying when you feel like it and think that you're going to learn everything by osmosis. No, you have to discipline yourself to study. You have to discipline yourself to read. And you have to discipline yourself to control your state of mind. So let's look at some biblical texts about anxiety and fear. This is not exhaustive. I just, I just threw a few of them out there. They're, they're, there are literally hundreds of texts in the Bible that we could uh, we could cite, but this is just some of the ones uh, from the Old Testament, Genesis uh, 15 and 1. You know, the Lord is talking to Abram. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And of course, we have that uh, passage in Joshua chapter one. I want to encourage you, listen, read Joshua chapter one. Over and over again, God is saying in Joshua chapter one, be strong, be of good courage. I commanded you, be strong, be of good courage. He says, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And of course, that passage that I love so much in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, thou will keep him in perfect peace. That's freedom from anxiety, freedom from worry and fear. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That's the key. You have to discipline your mind to stay on, to stay on God. You know, old folk used to sing this song. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And then, of course, uh, we read this passage earlier, Matthew chapter eight, verse twenty-six. Uh, he said to them, "Why are you afraid?" O ye, O you of little faith, then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And we also read this one, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Then, of course, the one we just read a few minutes ago, Revelation 21 and 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers and the homemongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So let's look at a word study right quick uh, of some of the key words in John chapter 14, verse 27. Uh, the Greek word for trouble. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, the Greek word is a word that means to agitate, trouble a thing by the movement of its part to and fro. Uh, you know, I, I thought about the old fashioned washing machine. You know, they, that, that thing that, that's in the middle uh, with clothes, turn the clothes, it agitates the, the clothes. It turns them and tosses them to and fro. It is to cause one inward commotion, to take away his calmness of mind, to disturb his equanimity, to disquiet, to make restless, to stir up, to trouble, to strike one's spirit with fear and dread. 
to render anxious or distressed, to perplex the mind of one by suggesting scruples or doubts. And then again here now, he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let not your heart be filled with anxiety, neither let it be overcome with cowardly fear. Because that word afraid in that verse is that word that, that the Hebrew, I mean, Greek word, rather, that has the meaning to be timid, and fearful, has the connotations of being cowardly. And this is the lone occurrence of this uh, verb form in the Greek New Testament. There's a similar verb that occurs three times in the Greek New Testament. We just read those. The similar verb is cousins it's in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 8, 26, Mark 4, 40, and uh, Revelation 21, 8. And this word means it has the meaning of cowardly, timid, fearful. You'll never find a text in the Bible where this Greek word is used uh, in a uh, approving way. Always has a native connotation. And of course, that word in the in 2 Timothy 1 7 that we just read, where it has, we said God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. That's what he literally means. Uh, so this, this, this word, it only occurs along with the noun form and the verbal form, only occurs about five times in the Greek New Testament, in the entire Greek New Testament. And this is cowardly fear. And this is the fear that God does not approve of. God disapproves. In fact, God condemns it. And I have there see Revelation 21 and 8, because we read that twice already where the fearful is at the top of the list of those who will have their part in the lake of fire. That's a, that's a, that is a dreadful thought. So what is the basis of our dominion over anxiety and fear? Two pillows. The first pillow is the trust in God. Trust in Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples in uh, John 14 1, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now remember, we said earlier, that word believe, to still, it means to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to place confidence of the thing believed. And is used in the New Testament of conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by certain inner and higher prerogatives of, and law of soul. It is to trust in Jesus or God as able to aid either in obtaining or in doing something. This is saving faith. It's not just a mental ascent. See, people, people today, Many modern Christians think that uh, to believe in God is just simply be convinced in your mind that he's God. To believe in Jesus, just simply be convinced in your mind that he's, that he's the son of God. But that's not what the Bible is talking about. Biblical belief involves trust and reliance. I always give this illustration to the church when I'm trying to explain biblical belief. If I say to you, that uh, I can, I, I am able to put you on my back and uh, go across a tightrope on, on one of the little unicycle things. And you say to me, yes, pastor, I believe you can do that. Well, you can say that all day long, but until you are willing to get on my shoulders and let me carry you to actually put your life your well-being in my hands, then you really don't believe. So biblical belief is not just a mental thing. Biblical belief involves actions. We show our belief by the way we act. So biblical belief involves corresponding action. The second pillar, so the first pillar is trust or faith. 
Second pillar is peace from God, peace from Jesus. He says in um, um, John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. And the word for world is, is, is cosmos. Cosmos. I'm talking about the world system, the world government. I don't, I don't provide peace the way they do. Now, the context in which Jesus was saying that, remember, the Jews were under Roman domination at that time. And one of the keys to the Roman Empire was this thing called the Pax Romano, Romano, the Pax Romano, and that's Latin for world for Roman peace. And, and what the Romans would do now, they would go to war for peace. In other words, in Rome, they kept the peace by oppressing people who would rebel. They kept the peace through means of war, intimidation. And in fact, the cross was a means of keeping the peace because it was a public spectacle when anyone's crucified on the cross and it was designed to instill fear in others so that they would not break the peace of Rome. So the world's peace, uh, the Roman peace rather that Jesus talked about in that specific context uh, was brought about by oppression. And then the world also uh, looks at peace, uh, thinks of peace as the absence of conflict. But now Jesus gives a different type of peace. The peace Jesus gives is that inner peace, that comfort, uh, that calmness in the midst of the storm, the peace that Jesus gives. It does not matter what's happening on the peripheral or on the perimeter, it, it, but you can have, you can have peace in the midst of the storm. You can have heaven in the midst of hell with the peace of Jesus. Uh, Leon Morris in the New International Commentary of the New Testament writes, he said, Jesus goes on to differentiate this gift from anything the world can give. Uh, when the world uses peace in a greeting, it expresses hope, you know, peace to you, my brother. May God's peace be upon you. That's just an expression of hope. It can do no more. And even that usually uh, does in no more than a conventional sense like goodbye, our goodbye or God be with you. That's what goodbye, goodbye literally means. Uh, literally means actually goodbye is short for God be with you. But anyway, he says, but Christ effectively gives people peace. Moreover, the peace of which he speaks is not dependent on outward circumstances as any peace the world can give must necessarily be because he gives people such a peace uh, Jesus can enjoin them to not be troubled in heart or cowardly so he, he's talking about an inner peace he's talking about an inner peace and the Bible has some specific uh, passages that we talked about that talks about peace. And again, this is this is one of my favorites, and I would I would encourage you to commit this one to memory and make it one of your favorites also. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusts in thee. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, and from the Christian Standard Bible, Paul says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why is it guarding your heart and mind? Because anxiety and fear threatens to take your peace. And so you have to pray. And if you pray, if you refuse to worry, but if you make your request known to God, the peace of God will guard your heart. 
Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Note now, it is impossible to have the peace of God or peace or the peace from God without first having peace with God. Because the Bible tells us that, that, that if we have not confessed our sin, if we have not repented of our sin, then we are literally at war with God. The sinner is at war with God. And that's, by the way, that's a war you can't win. And so there's no peace in your life. You wonder why sometimes people, unsaved people, are always, something's always going on. There's a passage in Isaiah says that, that the wicked are like the troubled seas, always stirring up in earth, in dirt. They're like, they're tossed like the wave, always some, always something going on. And so in order to have the peace of God and the peace from God, we must first have peace with God. And the only way we can have peace with God is that we have to become reconciled to God through his son, Jesus Christ. We have to give up, surrender our lives to him unconditionally, and then he will grant us his peace. Now, anxiety and fear are enemies. They are enemies. And they are the enemies of the word of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, we read, and he's talking about this is the parable of the sower, sowing the seeds. He says, others are like seeds sown among thorns. Those are the ones who hear the word, but listen, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Key thing about that passage is that these, these are people who hear the word of the kingdom and, and they listen and they hear and they comprehend and everything, the kingdom life starts to work for them. But they allow the worries of this age and they allow the deceitfulness of wealth and desire for other things to enter in and into the heart. And those things choke the word and the word becomes unfruitful. It's also an enemy as far as uh, our faithful preparation for the Lord's appearing. Jesus said, be on your guard so that your minds are not the dull from carousing, drunkenness and worries of life or that, day, or that day will come on you unexpectedly like a trap, but it will come on all who live on the face of the whole earth. Listen, a lot going on today with the president and his shenanigans and all this stuff with the coronavirus, but do not allow that to distract you from the, from the idea that the main thing in life is the kingdom of God. Listen, don't get stressed over the policies of the Republicans or the Democrats or the conservatives or the liberals, because all those are just humanistic. There's no salvation in them. If you are a child of God, your ultimate allegiance should be not to the United States of America, but to the kingdom of God. So what's the biblical antidote? And there is an antidote. You know, right now, they are feverishly looking for an antidote, a vaccine for the coronavirus. What's the vaccine for the anxiety virus, the worry virus, the fear virus? Well, here it is. Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Don't worry about your life. Remember the law of command? He's not going to command us to do anything we can't do. So 
So it's possible for us not to worry. Some people say, well, you know, I can't help it. You worry just now. Everybody worries. No. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Of course, the answer you expect is yes. He says, consider the birds of the sky. They do not sow. They don't sow or reap or gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You a little faith. So don't worry saying what we'll eat, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear. He says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That is the biblical antidote. And I, I would suggest you read that passage over and over and over again. Let that sink in your spirit. Pray about it. And say, Lord, what are you saying to me in this passage? Do some research. Do some word study. Do some serious biblical study on this passage. Because listen, this is the key for the cure of, anxi of uh, uh, for the cure of anxiety and fear. So let's look. I don't have them all, but just look at some. Let's look at some of the lessons. I just brought out a few lessons from Matthew six, uh, twenty-five to thirty-four. This, by all means, is not exhaustive. Exhaustive. But he says, now life is more than food and shelter. To live life obsessed with the mere pursuit of necessities of life is to live life on an animalistic or a subhuman level. I mean, this is what the animals do. I mean, that, you know, their whole occupation is, is going scurrying for food and, 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 and all this. We were made for more than that. Listen, can I tell you something? If your life just consists of going on a job, working on a job every day for 30 years, then retiring, getting a watch, you missed out. Life is more than that. Note in the text now, Jesus refers to God in the text as your heavenly father. So now if an earthly father, if an earthly father will take care of his children, how much more will the heavenly father take care of his children? He says, if God takes care of the birds by pre-programming them for success as birds, then how much more are we pre-programmed for success as humans? Everything you need, God has already placed in you. Let me say that again. Everything you need to succeed, God has already placed in you. The problem is we don't know how to access it. And sometimes we even abuse it. So worry or anxiety about uh, cannot add a length to life. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Worry and stress shortens life. Stress can kill you and stress will kill you. There are many people dead in the grave right now, have heart attacks, strokes, all this kind of stuff because they were filled with anxiety, and they did, not know, they did not know how to handle the problems of life and stress and anxiety and worry and fear took them out. Not only that, but they promote diseases, high blood pressure, all these other abnormalities can a lot of times be traced directly back to stress, anxiety, and fear. 
Now, Jesus used the term Gentile in this context to denote people who don't know God, people who are outside of the, of the context of the covenant and the family of God. Therefore, to be anxious, to worry, and fear over the necessity of the life is to act like people who don't know God. It's also, by the way, is also to exemplify a lack of trust. When you when you are when you're worried about all of this stuff, all things being equal now, because let's face it, some of the lack in this world is caused by our greed. And some of it is caused by the greed of others. That's why it's important that as many people be saved and, 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 and live the kingdom life as possible, because the more people who live the kingdom life, the more equitable equity we will have in the world as far as resources. So there's much talk today in the church world about seeking blessings. However, to seek the blessings of God is actually to act like the Gentile. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Jesus says, your heavenly father knows what you need. But seek you first the kingdom of God is right to you. But if you're going around asking, seeking blessings, then that means you don't trust God to give you what you need in due season. See, our Heavenly Father knows what we need and has already put mechanisms in place for our needs to be supplied. Even more so than, 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 than he has with giving the birds and the other animals, the other animals' instincts. Birds don't have strokes. Animals don't have strokes. Animals and birds and people uh, uh, in the animal world, they don't stress about how they're going to eat. But I tell you what they do do. They, they go about being birds. They go about being animals. And as they master being a bird, as they master being an animal, God supplies their need through, their, through the instinct he has given them. See, we're not instructed to seek the blessings of God. Nowhere in the Bible, listen, read my lips. Nowhere in the Bible will you read where it is implied or even stated that we are to seek the blessings of God. In fact, when you read Genesis chapter one, it says after God created the man, he blessed them. They didn't actually be blessed, he blessed them. Blessings are part of the package. See, we're not instructed to seek blessings. We are instructed to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things we need will be added to us as a matter of course. In other words, if we diligently seek the kingdom and his righteousness, we will not need to seek blessings because blessings will automatically come into our lives. Listen, blessings are not the main product. Blessings are a byproduct. Blessings are like sawdust. You don't, you don't, you don't saw wood to get sawdust. You saw wood to shape the wood to build your house. Sawdust is merely a byproduct of sawing wood. Listen, if we would just do what God has commanded us to do, if we would seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then the blessings that the world is seeking will come to us as a matter of course. The principle is all throughout the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 28, you know, that, that passage where it talks about being blessed in the city, being, being blessed in the field, and, you know, they've even made a song about it. Listen, but the first verse says that you are to hearken diligently. He says, hearken diligently. Do your best. Put forth some effort, he says, to do the will of God as it has been given to you. He says, when you do that, then he says, all of these blessings will come and what? Overtake you. Overtake, I, I want to read that. He says, 
verse one, he says, and it, it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee high above all nations of the earth. He's talking to Israel, but he's talking to us by way of principle, okay? He says, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Then he talks about blessed I should be in the city, blessed I should be in the field. He says, all these blessings will come and overtake you. Psalm 23. We know that Psalm. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me, David says, all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What the average Christian does not know is that that Hebrew word for follow in that verse is a word that actually means to pursue. It is the same type of pursuit that David is, is picturing as like an, uh, a, a, a ferocious animal pursuing his prey. So David is not saying that goodness and mercy will follow and tag along me like shadowing me like a secret agent. No, he's saying that goodness and mercy will be chasing me down like a ferocious beast all the days of my life. Then, of course, the passage here, uh, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Listen, people. God's, if you want to use it this way, if you want to use this term, God's prosperity plan is not you chasing blessings. God's prosperity plan has blessings chasing you. That's how you eliminate the stress. If you focus on the kingdom, and what is the kingdom of God? It is God's rule and reign in your life and in your affairs. His righteousness is doing things God's way. When you let that be the priority in your life, when you seek those things, when you seek the kingdom and God's righteousness, in the same intensity that the world is seeking the blessing, then he says all these blessings, everything you need will come to you as a matter of course. It'll be automatic. No stress, no strain. That's God's plan. It's not God's plan for us to seek blessings. It's God's plan for bless. It's God's plan, brother, for blessings to be seeking us. In fact, I think that's, that may be one of the reasons why we miss out so much on the blessings of God. Because we've not learned that principle. While we're chasing the blessings, the blessings are chasing us. And so uh, we, we, they, they, are, they miss us because we're not where we're supposed to be. That's God's plan. That's, that's no stress, no anxiety. It's trusting God. It's trusting God. Now, I want to give you some practical ways, some practical ways to exercise dominion over anxiety and fear, and then we'll be through. Let me give you some practical ways. First of all, and we talked about this earlier when we first started this. You have to, and you must, this is not optional, you must take control of your thoughts and your focus. Do not focus, that is, fix your attention on what is causing anxiety or fear. In other words, don't look at the problem. Yes, recognize the problem, but don't focus on the problem. Instead, focus on the solution. Instead of focusing on the problem, focus on possible solutions. Because what you focus on will magnify. When you focus on the problem, the problem magnifies. When you focus on the solutions, the solutions magnify. Because you will go wherever you focus. 
that passage in Second Corinthians, Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter four, verse uh, eighteen, Paul says, "For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen." And if you will look up that text in the Greek, when Paul says we look, he he uses the word. Uh, 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 that means we don't focus. We don't focus on what we see. We don't, we don't focus all our attention on what we see, but we focus all our attention on what we don't see, the unseen. Because he recognizes the fact that it's the unseen that controls the seen. So now he's not saying they don't even see what's in front of them. He's simply saying they don't focus on it. So here's what I'm saying. Glance at the problem, focus on the solution. Now, while it's easier said than done, you must, listen my friend, you must take control of your thoughts. Most people suffer from what I call monkey minding. And what is monkey mindness? A monkey mindness occurs when the mind is allowed to jump from one place to another or to be easily distracted by whatever the latest, loudest, or brightest. It's always, you know, you, you, you can't stay one thing because something else is coming along. And so your mind's off that, you only what's new. That's that's being a that's being that's monkey mind. And monkey mindness occurs because we don't make a conscious effort to gain control over our mind. And if we don't make a conscious effort to control our mind, our minds will always control us. Romans 12 and 2. Talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4 23 talks about the spirit of the renewed mind. You got to control your mind. Not mind control, is you controlling your mind. And you can do it. You can do it. But it takes discipline, it takes practice, it takes intentionality. Now, I didn't come up with this list. It's in the Bible. This is what I call the thought list. Thought list. Paul says in Philippians 4, 6 and 8, he says, do not be anxious about everything or anything. Don't worry about nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, we read this earlier, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And here's, here's the list. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. So here's the list. This is, your, this is your homework. If it's not true, if it's not honorable, if it's not just, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if it's not commendable, if it's not morally excellent, if it's not worthy of praise, don't think about it. That's, that's it. If it's not true, don't think about it. Don't focus on it. If it's not honorable, don't focus on it. If it's not just, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if, if, it's, not, if it's not on the list, don't think about it. If you want to discipline your mind, think about those things that are on this list. Think about, focus on things that are true. Focus on things that are honorable. Focus on things that are just. Focus on things that are pure. Focus on things that are lovely. 
focus on things that are commendable. Put your mind on things that are morally excellent. Put your mind on things, focus your mind, keep your mind on things that are worthy of praise. If they're on this list, think about those things. If they're not on the list, don't think about them. That's how you discipline your mind. So let me conclude. You see, there are people all over the world taking prescription and non-prescription medication to deal with anxiety and fear. And some in the medical profession suggest Anxiety is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. However, it really might be akin to the age old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, because while chemical imbalances in the brain may indeed cause anxiety, scientists have also discovered the fact that anxiety causes the chemical imbalances in the brain. But whatever the case, Life dominated by anxiety and controlled by fear is not the will of God. It is God's will that you live a life of peace, free from stress, free from anxiety. And I'm talking about that stress, anxiety that cripples you that fear that causes you not to do what you know to do, that anxiety that causes you to be afraid and be a coward when you should be standing tall and being bold, that anxiety and fear that causes you to shut up when you should be speaking. Sometimes it causes you to speak when you should be silent. Isaiah chapter 32, verses 15 through 18, talks about the time of the new millennial kingdom. He says, until the spirit on high, from on high is poured on us, then the desert will become an orchard, and the orchard will seem like a forest, then justice will inhabit the wilderness and righteousness will dwell in the orchard. The result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. Then my people will dwell in a peaceful place in safe and secure dwelling. That's God's will for us, my friend, to live a life that's free from anxiety and fear. And he has given us the means, the provisions to live that life. But it's not gonna happen by just us praying for it. We've got to learn to discipline our minds and we've got to learn how to exercise dominion over anxiety and fear. Well, God bless you, my friend. I pray and hope that this lesson has been a blessing to you. Please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, share it on your timeline. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Uh, because I'm sure you know somebody that need to hear what we talked about tonight the need to hear, they, they need to hear how to exercise dominion over anxiety and fear. Father God, we thank you that we are not helpless victims tossed to and fro by the winds of change, but that we can be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in your work so that our labor is not in vain. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us through your word, the means and the knowledge of how we can exercise dominion over our anxieties and over our fears. And we pray right now, God, that you would enable us to find strength within ourselves to do just that, to live a life free of anxiety, to live a life free of fear on a supernatural level so that when people observe us having peace when all hell is breaking loose, when people observe us not stressing and straining over the things that happen in life, that they will be moved to ask us why. And then we'll be able to share our testimony and to share you with them and to let them know that the same peace that we have is available to them through a relationship with you. We thank you for that power. We thank you for that potential and possibility in Jesus' name. God bless you, my friend. I hope this has been, again, a blessing to you. You can find this video not only on our church Facebook page, it's, it's, it'll be on in the timeline, but you can also find it on my personal YouTube page. And, and once you get there and find it, I want to encourage you to uh, become a subscriber to that YouTube page. But well, God bless you. It's been a blessing and it's been a joy to be with you tonight. Sorry for the little late delay, uh, but nevertheless, God is still good. Listen, tomorrow night, if you can, and if you're able, call into our prayer line and share with us as we pray for God to just move in our nation and to move in our world. God has been answering prayer in a miraculous way. We thank God for the prayer ministry. Well, listen, it's been a joy again being with you tonight. I hope and pray that you're blessed the rest of the evening and that you have a restful night. And at the Lord's willing, you wake up in the morning refreshed and ready to go on another day's journey. But until then, until we meet again uh, by this means, may God bless you real good. And my friend, go with God. And the peace of God certainly will go with you. God bless you. Have a good night.